Hello and welcome to Happier, a podcast where we talk about strategies and tips for building happier habits into our everyday lives. This week, we'll talk about why you might give yourself a derby name, and we will talk to the brilliant Mike Schur, the TV writer and producer behind shows like The Good Place, Parks and Recreation, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and The Office, about his new book, How to Be Perfect. I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, good habits, and human nature. I am in my little home office in New York City, and joining me today from Los Angeles is my sister, Elizabeth Kraft, who is very familiar with my constant allusions to the TV show, The Office. That's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in LA. And yes, Gretch, you have a reference to The Office for any occasion, often more than one. I really do. But listen, you've got a big update before we launch in. Yes, Gretch, we are starting officially prep for season two of Yay! Fantasy Island. Yay. Yay. So Sarah and I will be heading to Puerto Rico soon for several weeks, and I will be uh, doing the podcast from there. So I don't know what my room's going to be like, but hopefully it'll have a nice Backdrop. gorgeous background. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this week, our Try This at Home tip is to give yourself a derby name. And Elizabeth, this strikes me as a try this at home tip that might come in handy as you fling yourself yes. into season two of Fantasy Island. Yes. In episode 355, we talked about the try this at home of talk to yourself by name. And we talked about the research showing the benefits of distant self-talk. This is when you talk to yourself in the third person, like, hey, Gretchen, it's time to start working on those photo albums. You know, Gretchen, you got this. Go Gretchen. And we got a suggestion from a listener who really took that suggestion to the next level. Yes, this comes from Mindy. She says, I play roller derby. I think there are other derby players out there who listen to your podcast too. My <laughs> roller derby players give themselves a derby name or alter ego, much like Elizabeth calling herself Lizzie when she's trying to pump herself up. When I'm trying to pump myself up, I will call myself by my derby name, even if I'm not in a derby situation. Going to an interview and want to project confidence? Plum can be fearless when Mindy is struggling. So might I suggest that your <laughs> listeners give themselves an alter ego or nickname to call themselves when they're not feeling as assertive as they want to be? What an idea, Gretch. What a great name. I love the idea of a derby name. I mean, it, yes. it, it has power, but also whimsy. It's like useful and practical and yet it has that fun element to keep it from feeling like, oh, my gosh, here's just another exercise to try to get myself into the right frame of mind to work myself up. How fun. Yes. So, Liz, OK, we have to challenge ourselves first. Yes. Derby name. Yes. What do you so think I've... your derby name would be? Well, I've been thinking about it. I went down a couple of different roads. <laughs> <laughs> because my word of the year last year was butterfly, and I got very into it. I went yeah. down a butterfly road. I was looking up different butterflies like monarch or painted lady. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, I liked. But then I realized the answer was just right in front of me, Gretchen, and that's lightning, right? I had to have oh. lightning in it because... Butterfly was my word of the year for one year, but lightning is always my personal symbol. Yes. So, and then I combine that with Lizzie, which as Mindy oh. mentioned, I was talking about on the show is my pump myself up name. So I decided my derby name is Lightning Lizzie. Oh, I like that. And you already have a lightning t-shirt. You just need to get oh, lightning I, Lizzie put on the back. I have lightning necklace, lightning yeah. t-shirt. I have many lightning things. So anyway, so from now on, I when I need that boost, I'm lightning Lizzie. Oh, that's excellent. How about you, Grudge? Okay, so I was thinking about, again, like trying to think of the image of power and, and yet whimsy and what I wanted to do. And I went through a lot of ideas like you. And then I thought of the idea of arrow. Mm. And to me, an arrow, like it hits the target. It's smooth. It's frictionless. It's instant. It just feels like it's just going straight. That's how I want to be is like an arrow. And then I thought, OK, well, maybe the arrow. Mm -hmm. Then I thought, well, do derby names have like the arrow the way you see sometimes like yeah. the Hulk or whatever? And then I thought, yeah. you know what? The derby answer is who cares what people do with their derby names? Right. This is my derby name. I don't have to yeah. follow the derby name rules because it turns That's out. Right. Yeah, there's like a whole world of how to pick your derby name. So I'm the arrow. 
All right. I love it, Gretch. You are very arrowish because you're you're single minded in your focus when you want to be. But you know what? It's one of these things where it's not a bug, it's a feature. Because I you might say, Hey Gretchen, you're rigid and hey Gretchen, right. you're too self focused. And it's like, hey, distant self talk, Gretchen, you're the arrow. So yes, yes exactly. By the way, Gretchen, on this topic of distant self-talk, I thought of you in the car the other day because this song came on by John Lennon, 1970 song called Hold On. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of distant self-talk. It's him <laughs> talking to himself and saying, John, hold on. And it's all about, and he talks to Yoko as well, but a lot of it is just talking to himself about holding on. And so I thought, wow, if John Lennon was doing self-talk, then clearly um, the rest of us should be doing it as well. Let us know if you do try this at home and how choosing a derby name works for you. And let us know what name you chose and why. It will be so fun to see these. Let us know on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Drop us an email at podcast at GretchenRubin.com. Or as always, you can go to the show notes. The show notes for this episode are happiercast.com slash 362. Gretch, I have a feeling we're going to be talking about derby names for years <laughs> to come. Yes, yes. <laughs> Coming up, we have a happiness hack about giving yourself a treat. But first, this break. Elizabeth, the happiness hack this week comes from a listener who has a great suggestion about how to give ourselves a little treat. Yes, this comes from Rachel. She says... I've noticed that many specialty stores, salons, clubs that I belong to have birthday bonuses. When I register my account, I give them my birth date, and on my birthday, I'm emailed or mailed some kind of free gift or discount. For things like these, I've decided that I'd rather receive my birthday bonuses spread out throughout the year rather than all lumped together at my birthday when I usually cannot use them all anyway. So I invent different birthday dates depending on when I might like to get my free birthday ice cream cone, not my actual winter birthday, or my $3 off a bakery treat. Obviously, I don't do this for things where it would be illegal to lie about your birth date, but as long as you're not double dipping, I don't think stories care if I say my birthday is October instead of January. That's so much fun. It's so because well, Elizabeth, you and I often talk about wanting to get a present in the mail, just wanting yeah. a, some unexpected treat that doesn't demand anything of us that just it's just a lovely little surprise. And this is a way to sprinkle these surprises throughout your year. And as she says, is if you're not double dipping, what do they care? They probably would yes. prefer that you enjoy it more and are more likely to take advantage of it. Absolutely. It's just, and it's just a fun way. Maybe you'll feel a little bit like it is your birthday that day. Right. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. What a great hack. Thank you, Rachel. And now for an interview, we are going to be talking to Mike Schur. And I am a huge fan of so many of the TV shows that Mike Schur has worked on and created. He is the creator of The Good Place and the co-creator of Parks and Recreation and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And he was also a writer and producer for The Office, where he also played Dwight's Cousin Moe's. We are thrilled to be talking today to Mike Schur about his new book, How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question. It's a hilarious, thought-provoking guide to how to think about ethical challenges, both big and small, drawing on 2,500 years of deep thinking from around the world. Hi, Mike. Hello. Hi, Mike. Hey, we're so excited to be talking to you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yay. Look at that. You came prepared. <laughs> yes, we did. We loved your book. Um, but first up, my first question is, you're so drawn to the challenge of presenting very big, deep, profound ideas in light, accessible forms. Like The Good Place did this. Now you've done it with this book, which I can almost imagine as a textbook to help bring people into these big ideas. I kept thinking of one of my favorite G.K. Chesterton quotes, which is, it is easy to be heavy, hard to be light. Mm. And you really have tackled that challenge of trying to make, make these big ideas accessible. Why, why do you think you were drawn to that challenge? Well, first of all, let me say that I love that you know so many G.K. Chesterton quotes that you have a favorite. That's an incredible, <laughs> I an incredible thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I tend in my own work or career to just follow things that I think are interesting. And I ended up in this kind of odd place where I found moral philosophy and ethics just really interesting. 
and had the feeling that I wanted to write about it. And I don't usually spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out what I should do in my life other than write about things I think are interesting. So what added to the challenge was it's among the most opaque and difficult to access <laughs> topics that you can find. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's very, very tricky to the point where I've devoted a good part of the last six years of my life to reading this stuff and have no problem admitting that I don't understand a lot of it. That's partially because some of these texts were written 300 years ago or 2,400 years ago in Greek or German or French or whatever. Hmm. And it's partly because the nature of this particular beast is one that involves a real scientific examination of behavior and of natural and unnatural laws of humanity. And just, it's very tricky. It's very complex and layered and weird. I had this feeling as I was reading it and I and loving it, even though it was so hard and so chewy, that there might be a way to say like, all right, I'm going to be a filter if I can, mm -hmm. where I'm going to like right. wrestle with all this stuff and then try to regurgitate it in a conversational and hopefully humorous way so that people who might be theoretically interested in the, in the subject but don't have six years to spend reading mm -hmm. it right. can can get access to it. So that that's the impetus of this whole thing. Yeah. And now we'll see how successful I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, I keep wondering if all of these moral questions are material for your TV work, because I'm also a TV writer, and I feel like there's no better conflict than somebody who wants to be a good person, but they have a desire and I was wondering if exploring all that over the years has made you interested in these moral questions. It, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And to some degree, these questions have been around in other things I worked on before The Good Place. The Good Place was obviously yeah. explicitly about this stuff. And that was why I started reading it, was I wanted to know what the hell I was talking about when I made that show. But I co-created the show Parks and Recreation that ran for seven seasons. And that show was about a woman who was a budding politician in a small parks department in southern Indiana, but had sort of big ideas about helping people and about government and being a public servant. And we used to get into some of this stuff on that show, too. There was a lot of discussion of political ethics on that show. There were a lot of moments <laughs> where Ron main... Swanson being <laughs> exactly. kind of a completely different political philosophy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He had a sort of a moral code of his own and yes. Leslie Nope had a moral code of her own and they clashed sometimes. And, you know, ethics as a discipline, you can apply it to different things. And when you apply it to something like government, it has its own set of rules and boundaries and issues and problems. But it's certainly the case that in most of the stuff that I've written in my life, to some degree or another, ethics was floating in the ether. Um, it didn't become explicit until The Good Place, but I've always thought that this stuff was interesting and worth wrestling with and trying to explain and, and delve into. So, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever really written anything without ethics being some part of it somewhere, in the at least in the background, you know. Well, I like that your characters want to be good people, you yeah. know, even if it can be hard at times. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that they very frequently the stories tend to be things where people want to be good people and are put into positions where they find that desire to be challenged or compromised or something, you know? I mean, that's, I'm sort of describing storytelling. Like there's no, yes, that's, right. that's, that's sort of just the yes, deal with that, storytelling. Yeah. But, you know, when you're dealing with something like government or being a police detective or obviously like being in the afterlife and hiding from from people that the fact that you are not a good person which is what the good place was about those those issues come to come to the fore in a way that they might not in some other show and then mike i'm wondering with hollywood it's sort of notorious for bad behavior yes <laughs> and i'm wondering if you are ever thinking about all of these things when you sort of watch people around you um acting in certain ways <laughs> Of course I am. Yes, 100%. Well, Diplomatically look, it's, put. <laughs> it's it's 100% accurate to say that Hollywood is famous for, uh, notorious is a good word, for, for people behaving badly. The only thing I would say is that so is every other industry, right? Like, true, like, it's not true, like, true. It's not but like it's the banking. it's heightened in Hollywood. The, it's heightened it is. in Hollywood. Well, I think the difference is that the people in Hollywood are famous, right? Like, nobody mm, yeah. knows... 
who the investment bankers are at Goldman Sachs, yeah. uh, you know, that no one's ever heard of them. Like, and the people in Hollywood are famous, you know their mm-hmm. names and you know their faces. So I tend to believe that any industry where there's money and power at stake, which mm-hmm. is to say any industry, is always rife with moral quandaries and and bad behavior and everything else. It's just that nobody knows the names and faces of, mm. you know, Arthur Anderson Consulting. <laughs> Uh, people. So, <laughs> and so, maybe the people have more opportunity because they are famous. Right. They have a lot of ipp- opportunities to misbehave. Sure. Um, yeah. And yes, yeah, exactly. Hollywood has a way of tolerating bad behavior mm-hmm. in a way that maybe some industries don't because you give people a lot of breaks if they're famous or powerful or rich. And that's what Hollywood is. It's a celebration yes. of the rich, powerful, and beautiful. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly among the most famous arenas for bad behavior. So it's not easy to uh, ignore. There have certainly been any number of stories that I have been personally faced with or have heard of that have involved terrible behavior. And I think that what has been good about the last few years is that the whole industry has gone through a very public reckoning with its own terribleness. And some of that bad behavior has been drummed out of the industry in a way that makes it a more welcoming place and a more tolerant place for a lot of people who have been just been beaten up and ignored for a very long time. So that's actually been really nice that the last decade or so has been very different from the ones that came before it. Uh, Now, Mike, you took the quiz, the Four Tendencies quiz. I did. And, okay, so reveal and we must discuss. Because having <laughs> read your book and seen many of the TV shows that you've created and written on, I have thoughts. So tell us about your experience with the quiz. So I took the quiz, and it, it says uh, in the instructions that it should take about 10 minutes. And for me, it took about 30 <laughs> because I I agonized over yeah. some of the questions, but I then went through the quiz. The answer I got of what kind of person I am is a questioner. Mm-hmm. And then I turned in those results to you. And what came back to me was, you're not a questioner, you're an upholder. <laughs> and so, so I thought like, all right, well, let me go back and take this quiz again and answer in the way, when I get to those forks in the road where I don't quite know what answer I want to give, I'll give the other one. And when I did that, I got upholder. So I think maybe I was right on the border or something. Like I was, yeah. uh, in astrological terms, I would be <laughs> right yes. on the edge yes. of two Rising, signs. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're an upholder who tips the questioner. Right. But let me read to you some quotations where I was like, this is the testimony of an upholder. Okay. You said that since childhood, you were inclined toward the virtue of dutifulness. Mm-hmm. You called yourself a rules dork. True. You said that you can't break any rule, even if other people are breaking rules. You start having a voice chirping off. Mm-hmm. And you're clearly drawn to the study of rules and tools. Yes. Questioners just have this, why should I? They're always like, well, why? Well, why? Well, why? Thinking about so many characters in your show. But you have many wonderful questioners, too. But You have many of all the four tendencies in the shows that you've worked on. I just get a very strong upholder vibe from you. Not this why should I, but more like this effortless discipline and embrace. Yeah. When I read the descriptions of each of them, I felt more at home in the world Mm -hmm. of upholders, I think. (laughs) The part of the questioner description that I identify with is there is a little bit of a why should I in the service of like, well, does this rule make sense or is following this rule actually the right thing to do? Or is this rule Mm. being imposed by someone whose value systems don't align with mine Mm. or something like that? It's not a rebellious streak. I don't have any rebellious streak in my body at all. So (laughs) I I think it's more like six years of thinking about essentially nothing but moral philosophy and ethics has led me to be the kind of person who wants to dig in and understand why the rule exists in the first place and whether the rule is coming from some kind of code or or ethic that I identify with or something like that. I think maybe in those gray areas when I tilted over into the questioner side, that's what was coming out, not I'm going to stick it to the man kind of thing. <laughs> because right. that's not that's definitely not who I am. And all of those things that you cited from the book are true. When my teachers would say to me, "Okay, everybody line up." I would hustle to get in yeah. line. <laughs> yeah. And then I would be dumbfounded 
at the fact other people were still milling around or not huh, doing right. what the teacher, I was like, but this is the rule. Like she just right. said, you're supposed to line right. up. Why are you not lining up? So that definitely seems like an, an upholder kind of a vibe for a person, right? So that's either an upholder or an obliger because you're readily meeting outer expectations. But what I also get from you is that you're readily meeting inner expectations for yourself as well and that you will have the discipline to impose an expectation on yourself. And you don't need a teacher telling you to do it or whatever. It does come from within. That's what makes it. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. What, once, I, once I decide in my own brain that something is the thing I should do, it's very mm -hmm. hard to shake me away from doing mm -hmm. it. So if I, I tend to eat pretty well, just as one example, but if I go on a diet, I will stick to the diet, to the letter. I once was recommended <laughs> this like food delivery service diet, one of those things where they give you the meals, you know? Yeah. And I read the instructions and the instructions were like, you know, here's <laughs> what you do. You could have like, you would have to tie me up and forced food down my throat in order to oh get me to God. break yeah. away from what yeah. I had decided was how I was gonna eat, yeah. you know? Gretchen is exactly the same yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, that's what we get. Is we get, we have, a, that's what, a, we don't feel rigid, but others will say that we're rigid. Yeah. But how about a try this at home, Mike? What is a good try this at home suggestion that you would suggest for our listeners? I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this, but there's two small things that I think would fall into this category. And they're both in the umbrella category of survival in the digital world, mm. is what I would mm. say. It. Good. So I do two things that I have found very helpful uh, in the world that we're in now. The first one is I don't allow my phone to enter my bedroom. <laughs> I don't ever lie in bed and scroll through my phone or look ah. at Twitter or go on the internet. I had this feeling a long time ago, and maybe this is an upholder thing too, that you, my brain needs to like wind down at the end of a mm -hmm. day. Yeah. And I decided that at the end of a night, when I go upstairs, I plug my phone in in my office and I just leave it there. And I don't hold anything near my face that's glowing oh. uh, for, the, for the last <laughs> like 60 minutes or so oh, of my night. Yeah. And I have found that to be very helpful. It draws a dividing line between the world outside and the world inside mm -hmm. is the way I sure. think of it. Like mm -hmm. this is the world outside and I want to leave it behind. The other thing I do is I know a lot of people will open a notes app or send themselves an email or a text. And I do that occasionally, but I have really found that good old fashioned pieces of paper <laughs> that yeah. you write things down by hand, this, you know, remember to, my... <laughs> there you go. And yeah. I just write down the things that are important that I need to do the next day. I write down on actual paper. And I think the process of thought traveling from your brain out through your hand and a pen onto a piece of paper helps me remember them better. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing that I do with that thing is I put my keys on top of that pad so there's no way that oh, I can leave my house. Smart. I, yeah, I Very cannot leave idea. my house without remembering <laughs> that I wrote something down on that piece of paper. Uh -oh, that's Those little analog moments in a digital world I found very helpful. Mike, it was so terrific to get the chance to talk to you. Thanks so much. My Thanks, pleasure. Mike. Thank you for having me. And we're back with the Merits and Gold Stars. And Elizabeth, this week, it's your turn to give yourself a demerit. Yes. Okay, Gretchen. Um, for Christmas, you gave me your uh, wonderful Don't Break the Chain habit tracker. It's part of your new merch. And it's so pretty. And I wanted it. And I have not even opened it. Yes, I've only seen the cover. So what you're, you just showed me, I haven't even seen. I have not used it one you time. You have cracked the plastic. No, I was going to use it to record my rest 22 and 22. I wanted to record my not eating after 10 p.m., all of these things, um, especially though I was focused on the, the rest 22 and 22. But I have not even opened it. So... Apologies uh, to you because you gave it to me, but also happiness to merit. I know that I'll be happier if I track myself. I'll be more likely to do it, and that will make me happier. And I know all these things, and yet here we are. So that is where I am. Well, the best time to start was rest 22 and 22 at the beginning of the year, but the second best time is now, so you can start now. Yes, which isn't to say I'm never resting, but I'm yeah. not tracking it, You're which tracking. makes it less consistent. Monitoring. I do think you'll like it. I think you'll feel like you're getting, giving yourself credit. So I think once you start, yes. You, yes. It, you will like it. Well, I'll post a, a picture of it in the show notes if anybody wants okay. to see it. Or you can look at GretchenRubin.com slash shop if you want to see the Don't Break the Chain tracker. Okay, Gretchen, what is your gold star? 
Uh, we, as a family, watched just just a fun movie called Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. It's this 2021 movie. It starts in Nebraska, Elizabeth. So, of course, that, I was happy about that. We love Nebraska. One of the stars is Kristen Wiig, who, whose work I love. And she was also in Whip It, so that connects to mm. Whip It. It's just a fun movie if you're in the mood for something just funny and sweet. So I highly recommend it. I really, really, it really hit the spot. Nice. So the resources for this week, if you listen to Happier and, you know, most other podcasts, you hear us ask you to rate and review because it really helps people find the show. Listeners really respect the views of other listeners. So if you rate or review us, it really is a help. And if you don't know how to do that, I will post a link in the show notes to tell you how to do it. It's not hard, but if you don't know how to do it, it could be a little bit tricky. And give yourself if you have already rated, reviewed and followed us. We really, really do appreciate it. Also, many people love a beautiful quotation. I certainly do, like G.K. Chesterton's beautiful quotation. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And if you would like to get my moment of happiness five days a week, I send out a newsletter. I really just send out a quotation about happiness or human nature. Um, You can go to GretchenRubin.com slash newsletter, or I'll post a link in the show notes, include daily happiness quotations. One of the highlights of my life is choosing the quotations for this and collecting them. (laughs) So I love the chance to put them out into the world. Um, Elizabeth, what are you reading? I am still listening to What Alice Forgot by Leanne Moriarty. How about you? I am reading The Way I Hear It by Gail Hannon. And that is it for this episode of Happier. Remember to try this at home, give yourself a derby name, and let us know what you picked. We cannot wait to hear. Thank you to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Cadence 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Twitter at Gretchen Rubin, and I'm at Elizabeth Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And I just said it a minute ago, and I'm going to say it again. If you like this show, please <laughs> rate us, review us, and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Kraft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thanks for joining us. Onward and upward. Gretchen, what is going on in the background? I, it sounds what, crazy. Yeah, okay, so you know they're building that building behind our building. Um, and it's free. It's so yeah. cold here. I think that it might be the metal of the elevator. The elevator always makes kind of a squealing noise, but now it's like squealing and whining and shrieking and i wonder if it's something about it being so cold that is like changing the properties of the metal because it's bonkers oh my god from the onward project